We have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Marwan Gabril with us today. Uh, Dr. Gabriel is a transplant hepatologist here at Indiana University. He's also a distinguished, uh, distinguished clinician scientist with interest in advanced liver disease, viral hepatitis, and transplant outcomes. So he's perfect for this uh, talk. He's going to be presenting a talk entitled Liver Transplant Indications and Evaluation. Um, I think we can all learn a lot, even planning wise. So, Dr. Gabriel, thank you so much. I'll have you put this on. Thank you so much. And then slide it. And I can use this, right? You can use that. You can put that in the lapel belt. If you okay. Can. Yeah. Okay. Sounds so good. Right here. Further. How's that? Great. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Craig. Um, this is uh, quite a quite a showing, and uh, I think you guys are all very well informed. So I was struggling a little bit uh, putting this uh, presentation together. Uh, I have no conflicts uh, as part of this pres uh, presentation. But really, just sort of true to the title that Craig gave me, I thought I would just go through an overview of liver transplantation. For some of you, you probably know this too intimately, and it's going to look very basic. Uh, for others, hopefully some information. What I'm hoping to do is just give you an idea of what it looks like on average, what the process looks like, and, and hopefully leave you with an idea that should it ever come to transplant, outcomes are pretty good. It's a really good option. This is not just a sort of a slim silver lining behind uh, the black clouds, but it's, it's a real uh, you know, it's really what typically happens in most cases. So uh, that's, that's something I'm hoping to kind of leave um, with some uh, positive um, thoughts. So in terms of doing the, uh, the overview, um, I, I ask myself certain questions. If, if I'm going to go through this process myself, what would I ask? So how does it work if we don't know much about it? When do you need a liver transplant? Who's involved in this procedure? What does the evaluation involve? And what limits someone's candidacy to, be a liver, uh, to undergo a liver transplant? And at the same time, I think there's other questions that are not necessarily part of the title, but I think we will try to touch on, which is how good are the outcomes of liver transplantation? What happens to AIH after transplant? And what are the long-term concerns with this procedure? So in very simple terms, it's a surgical procedure. A liver transplant is removal of a diseased liver and replacing it with a healthy, functioning liver from a donor. It's a life-saving option for anyone with liver failure. The first successful liver transplant in humans was performed in 1967 by Thomas Starzl. Uh, techniques have evolved quite a bit since then. Expertise is more widespread. There's a bunch of fellowships that have been out there for surgeons and hepatologists. So what used to be uh, is sort of magic almost in medical circles back in the 80s and 90s is now really very commonplace. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And outcomes are improving. Even, even in the last five years, there is improvement in outcomes. So what does transplant look like and what are the types of transplant? There are really two main types of liver transplant. And these are really determined by the type of donor. Uh, for the procedure. So the vast majority of transplants in the U.S. are deceased donor liver transplant. That is to say someone who uh, typically has brain death through motor vehicle accident or stroke, but uh, organically the body is still alive, heart is pumping, liver is perfusing well. So basically a healthy functioning liver uh, in someone who is a donor or whose family decides they wish to donate organs. Those are the organs that we're typically talking about for deceased donor liver transplant. And there's also a live donor liver transplant, which involves resecting part of the liver from a live donor, typically the right lobe of the liver, uh, for implantation. Uh-oh. This is not good. <laughs> Let me go back a little bit. So um, I did want to show you just a few things anatomically that are of some interest and some relevance. And these have to do with just the, the plumbing, if you like, of transplants, so you have an idea. So really, we don't do this caval um, uh, preservation procedure anymore. Uh, livers nowadays, a deceased liver transplant is piggybacked onto this large vein back here, the inferior vena cava. So it's called a piggyback technique, and that's what uh, anyone right now in transplant would be talking about as far as a deceased donor. But what you, what, uh, the, the plumbing connections that are relevant are connecting the veins of the liver that drain the liver to the IVC, and then going into the liver, we've got a bile duct, we've got an artery, and we've got a portal vein. So there, there are some you know, multiple vascular and tubular structures that have to be connected. 
and, uh, and you'll see why that's relevant later on. So in terms of numbers, this is uh, data that I pulled from the 2012 uh, SRTR. This is the national database for liver transplant outcomes in the U.S., and it's really the, the home of the stats that are used for multiple studies. So a little over 6,000 transplants were performed, 132 centers nationwide. The vast majority were uh, from deceased donors, 4% from live donors. The most common age group is 50 to 64, but with AIH, as we all know, this is a disease that affects children, and so there's a shift in the mean age as far as uh, patients with AIH needing, uh, needing a liver transplant to younger age groups. But in average, about 8.4% 8, 8 of uh, uh, transplants are pediatric. And in terms of what is, what is the, you know, the subset of patients undergoing transplant uh, nationwide for AIH as an indication. So in adults, it's about 5%, and for pediatrics, it's about 2 to 3%. But we tend to see a lot of young adults uh, undergoing a liver transplantation with AIH. And uh, what I'm showing you here is the, the regions for liver transplantation. There's 11 regions in the U.S. These group multiple states. So you can kind of look at the region and kind of figure out which region um, um, you call home. We, we live in Region 10. Uh, I trained in Region 3. And this kind of overlying map really looks at transplant rates. And what I really want to show you here is that within regions and within states, so uh, what we're looking at here is that each, each one of these um, um, uh, um, cordoned off areas is actually an OPO. This is an organ procurement um, uh, organization. This is basically the areas within which organs are procured and then offered for donation, even within an individual region. So you could see that the rates, darker is a faster, higher rate of transplant, lighter color is a lower rate of transplant, so that even within the same region, within the same state, there's quite a bit of variability. And this is something that, uh, for anyone who's been on the transplant list, really uh, uh, you know, is a source of a bit of frustration. And UNOS has done quite a bit to try and even things out. But this is good to, good to be aware of. So what are the, uh, the main indications? Who needs a liver transplant? And the big one really is not just cirrhosis, but decompensated cirrhosis. That is to say cirrhosis that is really led on to organ failure. Not to say that that always ends up requiring a transplant, because sometimes with treatment, with tips, as we heard earlier, uh, things can improve. And um, one can pull back from the brink, if you like, and, and manage quite well. Um, but the majority of transplants that are performed are really for decompensated cirrhosis. And these are things like ascites, which is fluid buildup in the abdomen, which can become infected. Hepatic encephalopathy, this is the confusion that can develop as a, a result of buildup of ammonia and other toxins. Esophageal varices, these are large dilation of veins in the esophagus that can burst and bleed. And also, just liver dysfunction in the absence of these problems, if it's severe enough. The other risk in general, this is sort of overall national data, is liver cancer. The most common form of liver cancer is hepatocellular carcinoma, and it counts for about 20% of liver transplants nationwide. AIH fortunately doesn't see as much HCC, but it is possible and certainly uh, would be consider considered an indication. And then acute liver failure, which is a small subset of all transplants nationwide, um, uh, but is worth noting uh, in an AIH conference because AIH can present as an acute liver failure. It can be the first presentation as, as a fulminant liver failure. Metabolic liver disease is really not too relevant to AIH, but just be aware of it. So who, who's, who need, you know, who's on the team? It really, it's a question of who needs to be on the team. And so if we uh, try to answer that question, it's really we have to think of all the different phases. It's sort of four interconnected phases that make up a transplant, you know, going from needing it to hopefully doing well with it in the long run. The first phase I would look at would be an evaluation process. That's something really where I'm tasked to talk about today. The other, which is really we don't have much time to talk about, but it's the wait list period. And just to highlight that where, we, where someone falls on the um, organ transplant list in terms of priority is based on something called the MELD score. This is a formula that's calculated based on three labs is completely objective. We have no control over MELT score. So basically, once you're on the list, it's for the most part a function of what, it, what is the MELT score, and that's what determines your priority. Um, the transplant surgery and surgical recovery phase, 
and then long-term follow-up, otherwise known as life. So you know, this is where we're having to trick the, take the trash out, guys, and ladies, you have to remind us to take the trash out. Uh, but really, when you, look at, uh, when you look at all these different steps, you can see that there's a lot that goes into it, and it really takes a village. This is a multidisciplinary effort, and uh, um, something I personally really enjoy with liver transplant is how multidisciplinary it is. There's no I in team, quite honestly. It's, it's, a, it's a function of multiple people working together. So what would a transplant team look like at a glance? So it starts with the patient, of course, no patient, um, no transplant. Um, but really, I think that at the center of this, and I, I agree with the uh, speakers earlier, uh, where the patients really and the, the, the family and friends are together in this, and that's really true. And uh, the social support that's required for transplant is, is really a, a, a tremendous. It, it cannot be uh, uh, overstated. But we, we need quite a bit more, and I would say the first sort of priority person is a transplant coordinator. They're sort of the quarterback or second line quarterback because typically patients and their families are the first quarterback and keeping everyone in line. And I uh, completely support being proactive and taking charge and making sure that things happen as they're supposed to um, uh, uh, happen from your standpoint. But transplant coordinators really do the bulk of the work in uh, transplant. Then there's physicians. Surgeons, of course, do the surgeries in many programs. They actually will manage um, immunosuppression and the medical management of the immune system in the long run. But I would say that most programs in the U.S. are in, uh, run in terms of the pre-transplant and long-term post-transplant follow-up by liver doctors, hepatologists, and the vast majority of those are now becoming board-certified in transplant hepatology. It's its own um, uh, specialty these days. And of course, anesthesia, you wouldn't really think of it, but they really are very much involved uh, in trying to assess and ascertain uh, optimization of anyone who's looking at a transplant because they have to get that individual through this massive surgery, and they're uh, oftentimes dedicated team players to the transplant surgeons. Social workers and psychologists, um, this is really important, and these are uh, uh, almost invariably transplant experience and trans you know, have a unique phenotype in their training and clinical expertise in the area of liver transplant and how things apply to what's required through these four phases of liver transplantation. Pharmacists are critical, and that's because of the uh, number one importance of the medications that are needed for long-term immunosuppression. And also, these medicines have, uh, are notorious for interacting. There's a ton of drug-drug interactions, uh, even drug dietary interactions. So folks that like grapefruit juice or pomegranate juice can't do that because the more, most commonly used um, uh, uh, immunosuppressive agents interact with those dietary uh, 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 factors. So pharmacists are really key and we're always depending on them because every time down the line we need a new medication, for the most part, we're really running it by them and make sure that they really look at everything and verify all interactions. Dietitians are becoming also very key to liver transplant teams just because particularly at the uh, uh, forefront when someone's dealing with liver failure, oftentimes there are factors that are limiting in terms of being overweight for a transplant, or unfortunately in many cases having lost so much weight and being underweight and undernourished for transplants. So dietitians are really a key point. And then someone that you never see but really is behind the scenes making sure that insurance doesn't uh, throw a curveball in the middle of things is the finance office. So what does the uh, evaluation process then look like? So um, it was kind of fun for me to do, put this presentation together, Craig, is really just because I had to ask the questions, you know, what, why do we do the things that we do and how do we um, categorize these, you know, multiple studies? It basically looks like a shotgun approach and uh, un unless we uh, uh, put the reason behind it, it looks uh, almost insane. But anyway, I'll do my best. So can an individual physically withstand the stress of the surgery and recover? Uh, afterwards. So that's really the, the, one of the main questions. Are there problems that can help us if we identify them with perioperative planning and optimizing the condition of that individual? Are there conditions that get worse with liver transplant that we need to be aware of? And then um, much less tangible but just as important are uh, things such as is there adequate social support? Are there reasonable expectations for adherence to a complex medical plan? And is there stable mental health? And these are, these are all important things. We'll just go through these uh, one by one. Uh, 
So when we're trying to decide if someone can physically withstand the stress of the transplant procedure and recover, you know, we just kind of look at organ systems. And so first organ system to consider would be cardiac, um, heart health. So typically, a workup will involve a stress test of sorts, an echocardiogram, there will be an electrocardiogram. Uh, oftentimes, cardiac catheterization, if it's indicated clinically, it's not routine at many programs. We do quite a bit of it here, though. Uh, lung function, lung reserve, uh, x-rays or CTs, depending on the situation, to image the lungs. We assess functional studies of the lungs, volume studies, look at dynamics. Also tests to verify that uh, uh, the pulmonary system can oxygenate the blood. That is to say, you can get adequate blood uh, oxygen in your system. And also other organs, such as kidney function, which is important. This is assessed by imaging, do a bunch of urine studies. And functional status, which really should be very important, really does not have a standardized approach. There's not an um, uh, assessment of frailty that's routinely done. But I, I can't uh, uh, understate or overstate how important functional status is. But this remains a gestalt type of thing. And uh, in terms of the findings that can help us with perioperative planning or optimizing condition, uh, the most important of these, or one of the, the more important ones, would be imaging. Really, everyone wants to make sure they have a scan of the liver. Uh, typically, it's a CT or an MRI, really a high-quality scan that gives us an idea of the anatomy. We could rule out liver lesions. We could make sure that the blood vessels to the liver are open, particularly the portal vein, which can, ha can have some impact on outcomes. Um, as far as uh, infectious issues, we make sure that we check serologies uh, and um, in-state vaccination programs um, uh, before the transplant assess nutritional status and apply therapy if needed, so if it needs to be a restricted diet or supplementation depending on the situation. Physical therapy assessment if there's weakness or debilitation or frailty. And finally, liver disease management is also part of what we have to do. So at that point, those patients are really with, in the transplant program, they're no longer under the direct active care of their main hepatologist or their PCP. And so the transplant center now really assumes the care and every now and then, we come up with some ideas that can help address the underlying disease. What are the conditions that can get worse with a liver transplant? Well, I would say the big one in terms of the evaluation process is cancer. And what, you know, why is that? And the reason is actually very simple. Liver transplant is going to necessitate lifelong immunosuppression. And our immune system is critical for surveillance of cancer, but also keeping cancer that's already there in check. And so if we immunosuppress someone that is dealing with a pre-existing tumor, it basically goes haywire and will become life-threatening in very short order. And so that's a situation that really makes any type of immunosuppression and any type of transplantation very foolish, quite honestly, really jumping from the pot into the fire scenario. So cancer is really an important uh, area that we uh, always have to go through with a fine-tooth comb. And this involves taking a detailed history of any prior cancers if they're relatively early stage uh, in remission for a given period of time, typically five years, but there's always some give and take, uh, then those situations are not complete contraindications. They can be considered case by case. We make sure that we rule out any non-liver cancers. So the routine approach is typically a mammogram, pap smear, colonoscopy, and in males, prostate exams. If, there is, if there's a history of skin cancer, you're getting a skin exam. Um, as far as liver cancer itself, that's actually, as we already said, a very common indication for transplant in of itself, uh, particularly when it meets given criteria, not too many lesions, not too big in size. Um, uh, patients actually get exception points and get accelerated uh, 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 time on the wait list for transplant. Uh, the only exception for liver cancer would be if it's outside of the liver. So for anyone who's dealing with liver cancer and looking at a transplant, we real also have to do our homework to make sure that there's no evidence of liver cancer outside of uh, the liver that would also contraindicate the transplant. There's also, of course, other things besides cancer. Infection is one of them, so that's why we get uh, a dentist to, to look at things uh, carefully, make sure there's no disease that would become very problematic in the setting of immune suppression. Everyone gets cultures. Everyone gets tested for tuberculosis. We do fungal studies and viral serologies as well. And finally, kidney disease, I know we talked about assessing kidney function earlier, but this is also important to note under this heading because uh, the most commonly used immunosuppressive agents are very hard on kidney function. Uh, 
and there's a real risk of deterioration of kidney function, not only in the early post-transplant period, but long-term. And so if someone has a bad enough uh, uh, kidney problem, we'll oftentimes look at doing a simultaneous liver and kidney transplant. The psychosocial assessment, this is really where um, uh, our transplant social worker comes into play. Um, really verifying that there's adequate social support, and this is really necessary not only before transplant, but during the perioperative period and in the long run. And uh, again, you know, four years are better than two and eight are better than four. It's, you, you can't have enough people supporting you through this, but really good to have, I think, uh, in our world, uh, a go-to person. So while we appreciate having a lot of support, we find it most, most useful to have a one designated quarterback for the patient who really is keeping up with everything, asking all the right questions, and also communicating between the medical teams and the family. We need to make sure uh, with reasonable confidence that complex medical plans can be followed. And this is not so much for the good case scenario, which is the typical situation, but really more for when things do go wrong and things get complicated. It really takes a lot of trips back and forth to the transplant center. Plans can change on a dime, a lot of blood work, a lot of invasive testing. So it can be um, scary and a roller coaster. And so we need to make sure, this is really why um, the ability to, to uh, follow through with a, a complex plan is important. Stable mental health, really less of an issue in my experience in the world of AIH. It's more something we see with alcohol and uh, uh, subsets of viral hepatitis. But it's really, it's important, it's applied across the board. And uh, the medicines that we talked about earlier for immunosuppression also can throw psych psychiatric disease off balance. So if there's any underlying schizophrenia, uh, neurologic disease, it can really be uh, upset. And finally, and, and probably most people wouldn't be surprised by this, remission from any substance use and completion of any necessary rehab programs and aftercare. Tobacco use isn't often mentioned, but it's an important risk factor in terms of heart disease, lung disease, cancer. And so um, for anyone who smokes, we're always asking that they stop smoking before a liver transplant. It's not um, routinely a strict requirement. Uh, but uh, always an important thing to avoid, and I would say in the world of AIH where there's immunosuppression before liver transplantation, all the, all the concerns that we have with the adverse events of immunosuppression and, and other exposures that put you at risk are really relevant, and tobacco use, again, would be a very important one. So what are the typical things that we see that could limit candidacy? Um, again, these are really just sort of broad, you know, it's a broad overview, very uh, sort of broad strokes, if you like. But uh, some of the, the more common ones, I would say, would be advanced and irreversible heart, vascular, lung, or neurologic disease. So uh, someone who has a very bad cardiomyopathy, a heart that just doesn't pump well enough, um, someone with a very... Uh, 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 a large residual deficit, a stroke with significant residual deficits and weakness, someone who's needing a lot of oxygen on a good day, you know, they, they're unlikely really to uh, uh, survive uh, this type of procedure or do well. Um, cancers, if they're advanced or if there's been insufficient time uh, in remission, uh, can be limiting. Weight is, a, is something uh, to bring up just because it's something that is modifiable. Uh, and that's something that we commonly see in the world of AIH, more in the world of fatty liver diseases where there tends to be a problem. But a body mass index of 35 tends to be a limitation at a lot of programs. And so if there's a number to, you know, sort of uh, guesstimate being a limit, I would say that would be it. And then uh, finally, failure to achieve remission from substance use or complete rehab. Uh, marijuana falls under that category, so in, in some states it's legal even. So I'm not sure what they do in those given states, but uh, in the vast majority of other states where it's illegal, it's case by case in terms of center by center policy. Our center, for instance, views it as an illicit drug and uh, active marijuana use will, pr will prevent transplant for at least a six month period. Age is not on that list and I think that may surprise some people and it's really not an absolute contraindication. Even the ASLD guidelines, this is the large liver uh, society in the US, um, uh, makes a statement saying even age over 70, in the absence of any other obvious contraindications, would not limit the options of liver transplant. And that's, that's a nice thing to know. What are we looking at as far as post-transplant life and care? Uh, 
So the medications are lifelong. There's no really easy way to get off immunosuppression in the long run. And these medicines are needed to induce immunosuppression in the perioperative period, but also to prevent rejection in the long run. What does it look like as far as logistics? Well, in the first few months, there's multiple visits, almost uh, twice a week or weekly visits uh, to the transplant center, but things get better. Once uh, you're past the first couple of months, most people may come in at uh, anywhere from between three to six months, and then it's annual visits if things are going well. And in terms of lab testing, you know, how, how involved is it? Really not too bad if things are going well every two to three months past the first year. So if you sort of fast forward past the first year of transplant, things don't seem too bad, right? Labs every two to three months, an annual visit to the transplant center, and really just being vigilant and careful um, uh, is, is the way to look at this. And then finally, what are the risks and complications uh, related to liver transplant? And these can be technical. So you may remember that diagram we talked about, the plumbing thing. So any time we connect tubes, so vein to vein, that can get stenosis and that can cause back pressure problems or it can clot off. In the artery, same thing. It can be very narrowed and can cause a thrombosis. With the bile ducts, it's really not an uncommon problem that the bile ducts can either have a bit of a leakage where the bile ducts connect, the bile leak, or more commonly a narrowing that causes the numbers to be elevated, jaundice, elevated uh, liver enzymes. And uh, the latter a problem can oftentimes and typically doesn't require surgery, is often treated with ERCP. This is a uh, uh, endoscopic procedure to put tubes in the bile ducts to keep them open, and usually successful the vast majority of the time. And then uh, also wound infections or complications. Rejection, believe it or not, is not a huge problem in AIH. It happens quite a bit in up to 50% of uh, um, cases in some series, but usually is manageable. And we don't really see chronic rejection in AIH you know, a lot more than in any other uh, indication. And that's really good news. That tells us that, for the most part, we could keep things in check, even if we see uh, things like uh, rejection episodes uh, after the transplant. And there are general uh, risks, just like anyone else undergoing any other surgery, infection, bleeding, ICU care is really not uncommon in the setting of transplant. And so now that we've kind of gone through the whole procedure, let's kind of talk about the good news. How good is it? You know, what are we looking at? Well, really, quality of life improves almost invariably. It's really rare to see someone say, I wish I never did this. I mean, I, in fact, I've never heard it. Um, survival rates, well, these are average numbers. This is for all indications. This is, I believe, the 2012 SRTR data. One year rates of 87%, three year rate of 78, 78%, and five years of 71%. And if we look at AIH, um, this is really um, hard to pin down because there's not a lot of data out there, believe it or not. And perhaps something we should look at, maybe put together our center's data and then maybe look at the UNOS data to report it. I think it would be very interesting. But at least in the few single center studies that we have, it looks way better than the average um, uh, uh, a transplant picture. We're looking at five-year rates of around 85% and 10-year rates of 75%. So you may question, you know, wonder, well, why is that? You know, what's, you know, why is AIH so benign? And I think probably a lot of it has to do with the average age of transplant. So a lot of AIH adults undergoing transplant are younger than the average non-AIH patient. And so they don't come into it with the same amount of comorbidities and they have a longer life expectancy anyway. But I think it's just good news and that's, that's really wonderful to see. And in terms of a question I often get, particularly once we're past the first couple of years after a transplant, I always get this one, which is, how long can it go? You know, what are we looking at? What are, what are, what are the numbers? I need to make some plans here. It's looking good. I feel good. But what, what you know, and really, there's no, there's no expiration date. I mean, a liver can regenerate. It can do well. And if we can get past the technical complication period, you know, the Bermuda Triangle, very early post-transplant, and we can get past the immune issues if we don't see any evidence of immune-like problems in the first few years, then I think we're essentially home free for the most part. And that means that person has a very good chance of living out the rest of their life, not because of a risk of the graft failing, but it's gonna be the other non-liver related issues that, are, that we need to pay attention to. Does it cure AIH? Um, and unfortunately it doesn't, um, but we don't see a lot of recurrences. The average sort of quoted data that we see out there is about a third of patients, maybe 30, 35%, having some evidence of AIH recurrence within a four to five year period. 
Um, now, that sounds pretty scary, uh, but I will also say that the severity is very variable. A lot of centers do protocol biopsies. That is to say they do liver biopsies whether you need it or not. They want to keep a, an eye on the liver. And if you do that, you're going to see some activity that probably doesn't, uh, you know, a little bit of a bark with not much of a bite. Um, and so that 35% that, that we're talking about really includes a lot of patients, those that need a little bit of tweaking of medication, but also some patients that are dealing with some pretty significant recurrence. So that's out there, but fortunately it's a uh, smaller subset of patients. And typically we can address the disease by modifying the immune suppressive medicines. Steroid use I had to put on there because I, I, I imagine this is a hate fest on prednisone, rightly so. And uh, you can get away without it. Uh, that's the good news. Our program does something unique. We use something called thymoglobulin for inducing immunosuppression so that we're able to avoid the need for steroids in the early post-transplant period. But um, for the few programs that uh, do this, you know, we're at an advantage. At many other programs, they have to use steroids. It's part of the early uh, um, uh, induction program and early uh, maintenance uh, program for immunosuppression. And in the, in the old days of cyclosporin, this really used to be used just um, ad nauseum and really forever and ever. It, it never came off. Uh, I would say right now, most programs that don't do very heavy induction like we do, they're looking at prednisone use maybe for the first three months, six months, one year. But for the most part, after a year, pretty much every program out there is typically looking to wean off of prednisone. I think we, as transplant physicians, see prednisone also as a bad, bad deal in the long run if we can help it. When we have to use it for AIH recurrences or de novo AIH, which is really something very fascinating, patients without AIH, about 2% develop de novo autoimmune hepatitis after a liver transplant and really behave exactly like AIH and get treated exactly the same way. But for the most part, we're able to get away with very short courses, wean off, and look at other uh, therapies. I would say statistically, maybe half of the recurrence cases end up on long-term immunosuppression. This is just based on literature, uh, not our, not our um, own anecdotal data. And really, I think it's important also to bring up the long-term challenges with liver transplant. Um, uh, these really relate to two things. One, the medications that we use, and two is the immunosuppressed state uh, that one is in. So cancers are important, and I think this is uh, something that uh, I already heard multiple times this afternoon. And so if you're immunosuppressed, you are at risk of cancer. In liver transplant world and other uh, organ uh, uh, transplant and immunosuppression, the risk of cancer goes up about threefold, give or take anywhere from two to four, on average about three. So it's not a, a, a huge multiple for the most part, except for skin cancer, which really we don't have a good way of measuring against population data. That probably goes up about seven to 20 fold, so seeing the dermatologist is really key, and, I, and I'm, I'm really glad that came up earlier. And using UV protection, so it's important if you're immunosuppressed before a transplant and for sure after a liver transplant. Infections, well, keeping up with vaccinations, and precautions, you know, if you've had a transplant, it's probably not a good time to go camping in the Amazon rainforest. Um, uh, there's some interesting things, I think, you'll be in the New England Journal case reports. Um, and then kidney disease, really important because of the risk of related to the medicines that are used for um, immune suppression. So the things that we can do to minimize that risk would be make sure we have really good blood pressure control, hydrate very well, avoid kidney toxic medications, Heart and vascular disease is also important, um, and it's really mainly uh, re under, um, addressing underlying factors like tobacco use, blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. And these are also things that unfortunately get worse with the medicines that we use, so they really need very strict management. So at the end of the day, minimizing immunosuppression is the key, and that's really what we typically do. So to kind of summarize things, Liver transplant requires careful evaluation and active participation of patients, families, and the transplant team, and it's all about teamwork. Prompt attention to address any factors that may limit transplant candidacy goes a long way at, as, at the earliest time points. Should it ever be necessary, transplant's a great option and is associated with uh, fantastic survival numbers and a great quality of life. And at the end of the day, vigilance is always required. And with that, I thank you for making this journey and I thank you for your attention and uh, take some questions later.